hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today as I speak with Hiba Shabazz, who is a phenomenally talented artist who is based in New York right now. But Hiba grew up in um, Karachi and she trained in miniature painting from the NCA where she did her BFA. She received an MFA from the Pratt Institute in New York. Selected solo shows include Dreaming, which is currently up at Debuck Gallery in New York. The Garden, which was in 2018. Heba Sheba Self Portraits, which was a project for Empty Space in 2017. Hanged with Roses, which was at uh, the Goldberg Gallery in 2015. And In Memory, which was at Noir Gallery in 2012. She was an artist in residence at Mass Mocha, the Wasek Project, Vermont Studio Center, and the Alfred Z. Solomon Residency at the Tang Museum. In her work, Hiba is both the artist and the performer. Through the stories she creates, she contemplates what it means to be a woman. Her work, primarily self-portraiture, addresses issues of personal freedom, destruction, sexuality, and censorship by unveiling the beauty, fragility, and strength of the female form. And we've been putting up pictures of Hiba's work on our Divi's Instagram stories and also as a post recently. So do take a look at it after this conversation or go to Hiba's own um, Instagram page where there are lots and lots of fantastic images for you to browse through. But Hiba, thank you again for joining me. And I wanted to sort of get right to it and ask you about your initial journey towards art. So, you know, you grew up in Karachi. I believe you went to grammar school and you graduated. Did you know that you wanted to go into art at that point? Yeah, I guess I always kind of knew that I wanted to be an artist. Um, I didn't really know. I didn't really know how. Um, my dad went to NCA back in the day. Oh, wonderful. Okay. And my mom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was... Um, I think he, when Saeed Akhtar started teaching, my dad was like his in his first group of students. Wow. Um, yeah, so, you know, he had a long association with the college. And, um, but he, he made me study all sciences in school <laughs> uh, because he did want me to become a doctor. And, um, but I was always like painting and drawing and I used to go to Nayar Jamil for art classes. She's like basically an institution in herself in Karachi. And, um, I guess you just kind of know, you know, when you're, I don't think everyone knows. I always assume everyone knows. <laughs> um, I always, I'm like, what you don't know what you want to do, but yeah, I kind of knew. Yeah, it's very different for artists or even for people who are completely sure of what they want to do and for mm -hmm. people who don't know. Like, yeah. I remember I had no idea what I wanted to do when I was in school and there were many options and I was very confused and I wanted to study different things. Yeah. Which I think has translated into what I do now mm. in a sense. But that's really cool. And was it because you obviously went from, you know, having friends and colleagues who were doing diverse things to being surrounded by artists and learning a very interesting technique of the miniature style. So what yeah. was that journey like? Had you dabbled in miniature before or was this something that you sort of started off at the um, age? No, I had, uh, I didn't know too much about miniature painting when I started NCA. Um, I just knew they were small and old fashioned and mm -hmm. at some point, like I had this thing in my mind that I would be like some really cool oil painter. And um, not that I knew anything about oils, but it just looked cooler. And uh, I tried it out like the first day at NCA when we had our uh, blocks and um, it just really, it fit, you know, it fit like perfectly. And it's like when you do something and then you know, that you're gonna do it forever uh so I had like that moment with it and what an incredible um, moment and to have so early on you know like the first time you're trying out a new method of creation yeah that, yeah like this is it for me yeah and I think that's probably like that kind of connection if you follow it um 
uh, you find that I suppose here we are so many years later and I'm still painting miniatures. So it's, uh, it's something we do so much easier when we're younger, like listen to our intuition and we do it. We don't do it as easily when we grow up. We kind of like, we're like, oh, but I should be doing this instead. <laughs> That's true, up. actually. Yeah. You fight with yourself and you fight oh. with your instincts and you think, oh, no, I shouldn't just do X, Y, or Z. I mm-hmm. should do, you know, something yeah. else. Yeah. Well, you were very lucky then that you figured it out so quickly. And obviously, yeah. it's not that miniature is easy. It's actually a very, very difficult technique and it's a very difficult career to pursue. But at the same time, sometimes knowing that that is what you need to do and what you yeah. want to do makes it much, not easier, but more manageable. Yeah, I feel like it's kind of like having a life path almost. You know, when you do something and you're like, well, this is a purpose for me. And so then there is like, no, I never really ever thought, wow, this is so tough. Um, that never crossed my mind um, because it just like flew like the the flow of uh, painting it just came so naturally that there was just no question Um, so lots of very very long days and nights uh, studying and learning that and like zero regrets yeah Wonderful. Yeah. And you moved to New York um, to sort of further your master's and to further your technique, right? What was that journey like? What was the change like? It was, um, it was interesting. Like when I moved here, I kind of just knew that I needed a change, um, but I didn't really know what it was. And back home, even though I'd always painted I wasn't working as much like I was I was teaching a lot more mm. and um, I really just needed like I wanted to paint full time but I needed a, an excuse <laughs> I needed to give myself a reason to do it uh, so it just made sense to I don't know if this happens with you but sometimes I need to remove myself geographically from a space uh, to make a shift even now even here I go I'll like go for residency I'll try to go once a year because if I'm always in this room creating like I get stuck within myself and um, I have to like leave to kind of let myself break away from that uh, so it was because kind you're of like changing that your routine yeah because you're changing your routine you're changing your circumstances and the things that surround you yeah so you're like picking yourself that makes complete sense yeah yeah it's like a it's like a quick reset Mm. (laughs) a little bit um so I kind of moved here um on a whim uh, almost and ended up staying um and it was it was different I've I, I think I've always been pretty good at adapting um And that's part of like my personal delusion, uh, which I think a lot of artists have. We're a little deluded about life in general and um, never really thought, oh, I'm going to go to New York. It's going to be hard. What will I do? I won't know anyone. Or what happens now? I was just like, oh, I'm going. Ha ha. (laughs) That's the best way to deal with these things. And you just think I'm going and I'll figure it out. And often that's all you need because it does get figured out at the end of the day. You know that these are all things within your control. But Hiba, coming back to your art itself. Now you have a very distinct style, which we've spoken a little bit about, but we, you also have a very specific choice of subject with, basically as yourself and the female body can you talk about a little bit how you came to start painting yourself and how you came to start painting the female body and why you've continued to do so after so many years you know what is it about the female body that's held you so captivated and I think it's important for all of us to to, to know how captivating our own bodies are (laughs) so I think it's wonderful that you've continued to do that um You know, it was never, like, it wasn't a conscious choice starting it. Uh, I was just, uh, like, a preteen sitting in my bedroom. I had a really big mirror. 
and um, I was just drawing myself. And I didn't even take art at school at that time. I was studying sciences, so that was kind of my creative outlet, like on my own. Um, and uh, it just, it was just fascinating to me. And not just, I think just the act of drawing and uh, drawing something which was alive and it was just so much easier to draw myself than to go outside and be like, hey, will you sit with me? Um, and also, try, I think I was always trying to hide that I was doing it because I didn't want to get into trouble. <laughs> like, not because I was making the body, but because I was supposed to be studying and, you know, I had O levels and A levels and I was supposed yeah. to be a doctor. And here I was sitting, drawing inside my books and stuff. Um, but you know yeah. that makes sense because well I don't know what kind of a doctor you're planning on being but doctors also either. deal with the human body so it makes complete sense that that is also what continued to interest you yeah you it was a different aspect of it it was it, it was uh, very interesting and um I think even as a kid I remember just like I used to hide markers under my pillow and with a little flashlight and a little scrolls of paper. And when everyone would go to bed, I would pull them out and draw like tiny, tiny little, little people on these mountains. And um, so I think bo the body was always uh, there. And I did have try to consciously, I think my dad might have um, <laughs> one or two uh at least I remember, I, I was trying to locate one once, but, you know, when you're a kid, you never really realize these things are important because you're just going through them every day. Um, so, yeah, it started there and then it continued in college and then it continued and then it's still continuing. And um, I never really understood for a while why I was doing it. Um, it just came so naturally, but I have thought about it a lot since then, of course, uh, mostly because I've had to, you know, for every press release. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, uh, but it's, it's definitely something that I'm still very much involved with and continuing to work on even now. Um, and I feel like, I don't, I don't know exactly how to say it, but I feel like, I think all artists are kind of become obsessed with something, like with they some do. with some focus or some element. Like uh, if you look at Khadim, he'll make his demons, right? Yeah. And then he'll, he'll always make these leaves like this. Hi, Khadim. I hope you're listening one day. <laughs> <laughs> and I love his leaves and I love his demons, but like, yeah, it's, it's kind of been his obsession. Um, it becomes into your sort of signature element or your focus point in a sense. Yeah, yeah, I think it does, like, un unintentionally. And I think artists also change. Uh, sometimes there, there are artists who, at some point in their life, like, go through that kind of change. I feel like I've gone through changes with mediums, but not with the subject. Let's talk about the changes you've gone through with the mediums. Um, so you started, how, how have you seen your work transform over time? What have you started experimenting with perhaps? So um, after maybe 10, 15 years of doing just miniatures, <clears throat> I, um, I, I started expanding the scale of the paintings and what I was doing was I was still working on paper but the figures became life-size and I don't know why this suddenly became really important but it just felt really important to make the figures as large as I was um, and I think I needed to connect with them in a different way so they became life-size and um some of the mediums transitioned. I was still working with watercolor. I was working with paper. I still paint the figures with tea. Um, but they're big now. And then from there, I started doing cutouts. Mm. 
Um, and the karats kind of started because I was doing this huge, like, Leda and the Swan painting. And it was really distressing me because it felt like such a strong image. And so I chopped the swan's head off and I cut, cut her out with wings. <laughs> <laughs> I still have her. She's still here. Uh, she's ha- she hides. She's in my studio. Um, she lives here. She's never been exhibited. Um, but one so, day. <laughs> who knows, you know. Um, so I started doing these like huge gardens in the studio and that also kind of happened, um, around the time the elections were happening here and, um, that was, uh, like a difficult moment, I think for all women in general, because we yeah. felt really marginalized and not welcome and so I wanted to make a space in the studio which felt good for women and like safe and, you know, beautiful. That makes complete sense. And I think we need that. We need to see more beauty in our lives and we need to see more of us actually. Like yeah. Everywhere. I think the way women relate to each other is so different from how sometimes they are perceived from the outside as the other. That's true. Yeah. So, um, and I kind of wanted to, I, I'm aware of how so many different people perceive me. Uh, not probably completely for, which is probably for the best, but a little bit. <laughs> but I but also perceive wanted you to, as an artist or perceive you through your work? Because obviously the perception of you through your work and the perception of you through you are two fairly different um, I think in, in every way, like I was at, at this artist talk with this young painter here in New York, her name is Susan Chen, and um, they were talking about self-portraiture because all of us women were working with some form of portraiture and she was like, um, when Lucian Freud uh, started doing self-portraiture, no one was like, why are you painting self-portraits? True. And I found that so interesting but also so kind of on point that like women are always kind of under a little extra scrutiny uh, mm-hmm. about like everything you know, about literally every everything and I guess we should take it as a compliment but you know at the end of the day it also becomes depending on how you grow up like I was always brought up to try to make everyone else happy And I think the painting sort of filled that void for me where it gave me um, a voice, which was mine, which had nothing to do with anyone else or their their happiness. Um, And it was just like a form of female expression, which was not dictated by anyone outside of me. And it's also about how you see yourself. And I, that's one of the things that I actually really love about your work or how you see a version of yourself or you want to project yourself, perhaps. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. But what I love about your work is how beautiful the figure always is. And that makes me so happy because I think as individuals, as women, we have a habit of nitpicking on ourselves and perhaps you know, highlighting our flaws or not embracing the beauty within us and the beauty outside of us. And I feel as though your figures are stunning and the Thank you. backgrounds, the foreground, everything is so meticulously and perfectly done. And so the entire thing becomes into this little tiny jewel. And that's also wonderful because it does remind me of the, the previous Mughal miniature albums, perhaps. Mm. that miniature art even now you know the Persian albums Mughal albums that currently everything is inspired by where those paintings are also so meticulously and perfectly done and the figures are Mm. stunning they're beautiful and I think sometimes we forget that art is allowed to be beautiful art is allowed to be jewel-like so I really appreciate that about your work are there any particular motifs that you enjoy working with I've noticed that a lion has been making his way through particular works of yours as well as portions of your studio (laughs) 
particular, I mean, why do you choose them? Do you want to chat about that or? Um, sure. Well, um, the lion, I guess, is now really big, so it's much more noticeable. But yeah. I actually found, um, I have these drawers in my studio where I hide things, hide paintings. I found like a few miniatures of hybrid man lions. And oddly enough, I think the one time that I showed a miniature in Pakistan, maybe at Chokhandi back in the day, it was actually a painting of a lion with a woman, uh, except the woman wasn't painted through. She was just a shadow. Um, and I have a vague recollection of showing that for some benefit or something. So I don't think it's very new. Um, I've always been drawn to lions, some, some years more so than others, but I think it's kind of a symbol for me a little bit, like a symbol of uh, protection maybe. And uh, so the lion comes into the paintings and uh, lots of lilies in the cutouts and in, uh, in the yeah. large paintings and um, lots of trees. I would say there are so many natural elements because Miniature was kind of my vocabulary going in and expanding on that, uh, it felt like I took some elements out of the paintings and brought them from the small paintings to the large ones. So um, I feel like a lot of birds and flowers and uh, elements have translated into larger paintings. And I, I kind of like to make everything beautiful. It's... Um, I think beauty is such an important part of Eastern art and culture in a way. And um, it's kind of so stigmatized now in like modern society uh, in a way that I don't understand completely. But just because growing up, I was so involved with miniature and that whole process of beauty, harmony, colors, and like making a painting sing and... Um, that I kind of don't understand why it shouldn't be beautiful. Uh, so I just kind of stick to <laughs> stick to that a little bit. No, I agree with you. I think you're entirely right. And the way that you also use these elements has been sort of morphing in a sense over the years, perhaps as the scale of your work has also grown. How, how have you dealt with that um, in terms of, of continuing to use certain elements, the floral imagery, the animal imagery as well, as the pictures, to using tea stains, to finally the cutouts. Were you a little bit nervous about keeping the integrity of your work as the work became larger and larger? Or was that, as it, did it just sort of move organically? Um, I feel like the there was, there were like many years between me thinking I want to do something big and me doing it. Uh -huh. So I think I wasn't ready for a while. And that's because when you're trained in something which is so precious, mm -hmm. um, it's hard to let it, let that go. But also you feel like you are taking care of a certain tradition and um, you want to do it justice. And so there were like a lot of reasons why it took it took me a long time to to move uh, but i think once the movement started it just like it just kept moving 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 like it like turned into one tiny step turned into this has turned into this prolonged period of change and um i still have no idea where it's going to end up because things have kind of been changing so fast uh, where, where it comes to translating the mediums and the scale. Um, but I think it's important, like change uh, is, 
is so important in a way that I didn't really understand maybe growing up that uh, a part of me always felt like we're supposed to stay the same and like we're supposed to like keep our keep keep what we had as kids but then another part of me realized that um, that's a really bad idea <laughs> like, cause, like like basically if you if you don't change then you won't grow and you won't learn new things and you won't challenge yourself repeatedly and so definitely like even with this show this is the first time showing oil paintings and they're so new a part of me was not ready at all to show them but another part of me knew that if i don't show them i'll kind of get stuck in this initial phase and the sooner i show them the sooner i can like move forward um and then there's like that whole criticism which comes in that but but why are you changing and why oil paint and why not this and why is your hair so long why didn't you get a haircut like it's <laughs> it's like endless right like there's like a lot of it is endless but you know what lies. you were saying about change and kind of moving on to newer things mm. it's also important to remember it's okay to shed the old mm. simultaneously so if there are things that you need to let go of during this journey that's also yeah. completely okay and if there are things you want to hold on to that works yeah. as well it it is very personal in that sense yeah. and i was going to ask actually and you sort of touched upon it the how it was putting together this recent show especially given the times that we've all just we're, we're still moving through them times of isolation and also how people reacted to the work and what you thought of their reactions cuz this um, exhibition it It's in New York right now, and it's at the Debuck. Yeah, yeah. So, well, it was a little. Some parts of it were challenging because, you know, the pandemic and just a shortage of materials. Like getting the work framed. Um, my the large paintings are, I think, sixty by eighty four. The works on paper. Wow. Um, which is over like a mount size so just getting like special materials to frame or getting plexi that size was not possible like as it is all the plexi was on storefronts because we've been going through the black lives matter movement here so people yes. had like appropriated all the plexi and tr- were trying to protect mm. their stores like lack of lack of materials different shipping times just like so many so many things that you don't really think of and then you have an exhibition but and you're like uh oh <laughs> yeah you don't have an opening um yeah. the, then the framers are struggling just like so many different things that came up uh so that was interesting to navigate um and then an exhibition by appointment or the gallery can only have legally only have 20 people in it at a time which is crazy like for a new york gallery uh, so but i just, i have to say even 20 people at one time seems very brave to me right now <laughs> yeah. 20 is enormous yeah yeah we did a meet and greet and when the room would get crowded i would start counting heads <laughs> yeah good so Put the um, mask back on <laughs> yeah Yeah so um that part of it was challenging and I did another show in May which was all all miniatures and mm. um that was also really challenging in the way that that was a really kind of a gentle soulful show and like no one actually saw it <laughs> like I saw it but even and i i don't i don't think even my gallerist saw it uh, because it went from me to the framer and then it started getting shipped to the owners of the work um oh wow so no one actually sh- other than online no one actually saw that exhibition in person completely um how do you think that changed the not the meaning of the work but it it changed the exhibition for you thinking that okay well people can only see it online Because even online, I mean, you can yeah. zoom in quite close, but it's yeah. not the same as seeing the work in person. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I wanted to create an experience in which um, 
people could zoom in real close and also get get the meaning of the work and we did like some audio pieces and video pieces to go along with it to give it like to create a connection because like a show you want what you're aiming for as an artist is to connect um and so I, we tried to create that through the website uh but yeah when all the work was ready and it was framed and i was just looking at it and i was like wow this is like so sad <laughs> it felt like a little bit heart wrenching um but you know no regrets creating it but i was like wow this is such a weird time to have a show and then i went and had another one <laughs> Very brave of you, by the way, because I don't know whether you are used to working in complete isolation. But I, I would imagine that it would be quite difficult to put together two new bodies of work, given the sort of state that the world was in, and given the yeah. fact that you really have to focus as an artist. Yeah, and I don't. It sort of doubles the isolation, in my opinion. If you're sort of separate from everybody else, and you're separate in your studio, yeah, and you know you have to work away, so you can't even give your mind that moment to rest. Yeah, I am I am now that the show is up a little bit feeling the effects of the the rigorous last 6 months. Um because of course there's the isolation of working alone as an artist and then there's uh already you're in a state of quarantine uh so and then you're really likely to kind of overdo overdo everything. <laughs> so it was um it was great for like holding space and concentrating on one thing uh which you kind of need to do before a show um but also it was it was a little quick like it was back to back and it was a little um you know it was like i, I didn't have any downtime during that uh, and emotionally you're like putting like you put so much emotions like you put so much of yourself in your paintings it's like this kind of energetic exchange happening with your canvas and um that also like you know your you have to like be mindful of how that's affecting you with the small paintings it's different it's very meditative and it's a very different way to hold space but with the large paintings like your entire body is involved and you're working So yeah it was it was interesting and it was a interesting learning experience as well um with the oils and but it all you know it came together it went up i mean the show has been so far it seems like it's been pretty well received um i guess we have had a bunch of people come in to write about it and i'm probably expecting all those articles out in another week or two uh and then I'll really know How, were you surprised by any of the questions or the comments that perhaps journalists asked you when they saw the larger paintings and how did you feel having put those up um i felt uh i i i was really terrified before i put them up but once they went up it was okay there was one painting which wasn't complete so um my gallery gave me their code during labor day and i went in and i painted it for 3 days at the gallery and then when i felt like it was complete um at that point i i started letting go of the show i think a lot of artists will tell you that there's like this point where you're when you're working you're like deeply connected to what you're doing and then when you put it out there you have to take a step back and then let other people connect to it so it's it's been like i feel like what's really interesting about the large paintings is the women connect to it so deeply um my artist liaison at the gallery was telling me it's like this room has been full of young women just coming in and getting excited about the work and I've always understood this about my paintings that um as an artist I just tend to connect more like with women even at the studio I have a lot of women who come through who tell me their stories and 
um, and it's you. It's not always necessarily dark skinned women, although dark skinned women do specifically say about the large works that they feel like uh, they can identify more with it, and they have been wanting to be able to see themselves in a painting uh, as opposed to I guess the more European tradition of oil painting which depicts a, a different uh, different women um, but I feel like generally women connect to the work emotionally because when you're standing with it it is there's so much like female energy in it and it has yes. it's like so female centric that it just it's like a very kind of natural process and I, I really enjoy that like that's the part for me which is most rewarding when someone comes in is like I want to get this painting because I'm raising a daughter and I want her to grow up with something that looks that's like special, her yeah yeah, yeah that's wow. the part which works for me or even to sort of create these reactions in people where they just want to come and stand and look at the painting and feel proud of themselves as women after looking at, the, at your work. Yeah. That's very special. Yeah, yeah. I like that it, it, I, it can have that connection. I feel like very, very grateful that um, it has that. That people respond like that. Wow. Mm -hmm. And this kind of leads right into something else I wanted to ask you. I mean, you've had, you know, so many people admiring your work. You've been part of residencies, of gallery shows. What do you think would be a, an important moment for you, even just a couple of them, important moments for either being good or being bad, um, or any even paintings that you created that kind of led to something else? And so because of that mo reason, they, they remain embedded in your memory. That's a hard one. Um... Take your time. Well, I know that with this show, uh, I put in a painting right at the end, which was, wasn't was going to be in there, but I started painting it. And um, I had kind of let go that of the idea that the work was going into a show. Like, I'm not great with deadlines. Usually, I just like to work for myself and then give the work later. That's best, yeah. Um, and as soon as I let go the oil paint started flowing exactly how it should be. And I realized like in this moment, I was like, wow, I've been fighting with this oil paint for a year because I'm like, I'm thinking, can I do this? Can I not do it? What if I can't do it? Um, or why, like, why isn't it moving the way I want to? Cause I'm so used to water-based paint. Yeah. And when I finally let go of the control, it just started, making itself um and i think a lot of artists can identify with this feeling that of course you make art and some artists are more like mentally inclined than others but i think for a lot of us like we we do also tend to go a little bit in a flow state and the work happens and we kind of witness it a little bit sounds like really hippy dippy but <laughs> Yeah, but that is what it's like, by the way. And, and I think that's a really good metaphor for life. Sometimes the more you yeah. can control things, the worse it all becomes. Oh. And then you kind of accept how small and insignificant you sometimes are in the larger universe and how things come to you when they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And then things just move on forward and fall into place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was kind of a realization towards the end. And I, I texted my art dealer and I was like, I think I finally got it, but the show is next week. So the next one will be really good. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. At least the next one will hopefully be visited by even more people and you won't have these max limits of 20 people at some point in the gallery. Yeah, yeah. So I hope there's so. There's that to look forward to. But speaking mm. of what, what's next for you, do you know? Um, a little bit, I guess right now, just like for work, I guess I'm working for a couple of group shows in October and then our Art Basel is cancelled in Miami, but, um, we're still thinking of doing Untitled, which will be online. Okay. So I need to make some work for that. 
sounds exciting. Yeah, yeah. And at least um, you know you can do it now. <laughs> you have it under control. Honestly, like on my day to day, I love painting. I love painting, but deadlines like don't even make me start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's diffi- it's always difficult to do something creative when you know you have to do it. It just makes yeah. it that much harder. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, and we're just going to open up for questions. So anybody who has any questions, please write them out and I'll get to them. But before we do that, do you have any advice for young artists that perhaps mentors gave you, art world mentors, non-art world mentors, or even advice that you've sort of thought of given your experiences? Um, yeah, I guess so. I, I would say that maybe what I've learned is um, you really have to follow your intuition. Mm. Like honestly, everything else is garbage. The, the trends, like what you think you should be doing, what the world is doing, what the world is telling you to do. It's, it's not, it's just not relevant because we're all like so unique and we're all brought up I mean, we're all connected, yes, but we're all so unique and with our own voice. And like our job as an artist is to honor that voice and it's not to honor someone else's voice or what, you know. That's really true. Yeah, what someone else thinks you should be doing or like if everyone is painting abstract, you have to paint abstract. Like it's not like that. And it's hard. It's hard. But it's like deeply rewarding to... to to do that because um, like the art world is always kind of at least here in New York it's always going to kind of go up and down and your career is always going to be like in waves so if you can if you can stay true to yourself then you you never lose and if you, you yeah follow a trend and the trend falls like trend goes into a new trend two years later then you've you've kind of already lost agreed and especially when things become tough and they always do mm-hmm. if you are not following something that is true to you it's almost impossible to follow through with it then yeah it's that yeah. kind of shining light that you know what you're doing is absolutely important and absolutely true to you and you kind of keep moving yeah. at it then yeah yeah so we have two quick questions one of them is oh, oh sorry um they're both about your working style actually so i'll ask them both in one go so basically do you start with a sketch or go straight to the canvas Or, or, or lips. sorry, and then the other question is, when did you start using tea as a medium in your work? So um, to start with the, first, the second one first, tea was like one of the techniques we learned for, in, for Indo-Persian miniature painting. There's a technique called Nimrang, and that's painted mostly with tea. And that's when I started using it and never looked back. Uh, so maybe like 20 years ago plus oh. <laughs> and um, I don't sketch a lot like sometimes I do like tiny little thumbnails for the miniatures and for the large paintings um, I don't really sketch I'll have I'll have uh, tracings of some of the large figures and I might place them in configurations to see how they work best and then I'll paint them and I'll let the rest of the painting grow around them but usually like I start with the figures the focal point and then I grow the rest of the painting around it and try to harmonize everything wow and not not green tea black tea yeah <laughs> yeah I know. I remember once I was painting something and I was having a mug of tea at the same oh. time. And I kept like, without even realizing it, dipping the paintbrush into the tea and I thought, what a great color that is. And I realized it was all wrong. Because it, bla- it was milk tea, it wasn't yes. even the black tea that you use for tea washes. This happened so many times at the NCA studio. 
because we would be drinking tea, drinking chai and like working with tea. And then the brush was always in the wrong cup. Yeah. We just become <laughs> used to it then having slightly paint muddy tea. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It does not work well. Someone else had an interesting question. I mean, it, it's quite basic, but it's something that I think I forgot to ask you. They asked how you get inspired. And I think that's actually quite interesting. What do you find inspiring with all of these? Do you sort of, is it based on things that you read? Is it what you see around you, travels that you go on? Or do these figures kind of creep into your mind while you're maybe having a shower or a bath or whatever it is? I know it's a basic question, but it is quite fascinating to hear for those of us who are not technically artists. I think um, definitely it's a question I get too. And definitely like it's a hard one because you feel like you need such a concrete answer for it. But I would say that like my work is so, I think life is inspiring and I I think a lot of my recent work is much more emotional in a way. Like at least it comes from a place of um, an emotional space. And um, I don't know if that's inspiring, but that's what, what is, that is the content that is, is coming out. So it's the content that feels like it needs to be processed in the artwork. Um, and of course, like there are elements in the paintings, which are elements I see around me, which are, you know, inspiring and I find beautiful. And it might be like a beautiful sunrise that I see and be like, oh, I really want to paint that. Um, but usually like, I think there's like some weird inner journey, which is reflecting outside. Um, yeah, I think that's what's happening for the most part. That makes complete sense because I said all of us absorb so much and it is, you know, we just respond to so many different things and facets and mostly yeah. our emotions Yeah, because yeah. that is the driving force behind our responses. Yeah. Yeah. Life is like inspiring in a way. I like to take like anything that I can find, like those flowers or the lilies, you know, you see them in all the paintings or like a cup and I just want to paint it. But when I paint it, I want to make it into something really beautiful. So the lilies will not be two. They'll be like a thousand and the cup will be like golden, you know, and my hair will be perfect. <laughs> so, so, yeah, but that's yeah. such a beautiful thought, by the way, because I think we all sometimes forget how everything around us is so inspiring. If we just take the moment to focus on it and to think about how inspiring it might be, we often forget to do that yeah. in our day-to-day activities and Thank you for that. Of course. I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> I'm quite happy. <laughs> but you know, Hiba, on that note, unfortunately, we're almost out of mm-hmm. time and Instagram tends to randomly shut us off. So thank you so much for this. Thank you for taking out this wonderful hour to chat to us about your work and in so much detail. And everybody who tuned in and asked questions, thank you so much for doing so. And I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to some of them. But um, lovely to have you all, and I'll see you next week. Hiba, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this, and hopefully see you soon. Okay. Stay safe and well. You You too. too. Bye-bye.